Chicago has long been touted as a great cocktail city, and luckily last year, Marius and I were able to get there and to get to some of the establishments on our long, long list. Along with Sparrow, Three Dots and a Dash, and the recently shuttered Lost Lake, one of the absolute standouts was the Violet Hour. The Violet Hour was opened by bartender Toby Maloney in the Wicker Park neighborhood of Chicago in 2007. At the time, Maloney was a very well-known New York City bartender, not only for having been a Milk and Honey alum, but also having worked at many other influential bars, including, but not limited to, the Pegu Club and the Flatiron Lounge. Although I would peg the Violet Hour as a Milk and Honey family bar, in a lot of ways the Violet Hour is everything that Milk and Honey isn't. Where Milk and Honey was small, dark, and intimate, the space which the Violet Hour occupies is massive. Tall ceilings, wide space, it's still lamplit and it's pretty dark. The color scheme is like white, blue, and purple. It has big heavy curtains and high back chairs evoking a sort of Hollywood Regency style. The place is chic, and regal, but it still retains some of the best things about the Milk and Honey family bars. Despite its size, it still finds a way to be intimate. The hospitality is on point, the bartenders are helpful and gregarious, and you also have a posted list of rules listing the bar's expectations for its guests. And this style, which really amounts to the philosophy of the bar, extends to the cocktail program. You can see the influence of the Milk and Honey approach. The cocktails are very creative, but simple, relying on the bartender's intimate knowledge of ingredients to create complexity. They aren't a carbon copy of the milk and honey style, but rather they are an evolution. This bar is absolutely worth visiting, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Toby Maloney finally published a cocktail book called The Bartender's Manifesto. It is available now. You can find a link below, and it is fantastic. Everyone should pick it up and read it. It is everything that a new cocktail book written today should be. And I just want to wrap this one up by saying that I've been having a lot of fun with this bar series, but I also want to remind you that these are solely my impressions of bars that I visited, coupled with a little bit of research, and the views are mine and mine alone. So today's episode is sponsored by Shaker and Spoon. Shaker and Spoon is a monthly cocktail subscription box service that centers each box around a theme and around one bottle of spirits. Each box contains three different recipes from world-class bartenders, and every recipe makes four cocktails, so you get 12 cocktails total. So every box contains everything that you need to make the cocktail other than the spirits, from sodas to syrups, infusions, garnishes, bitters. So what's great about these boxes is that there's no need to buy multiple bottles of spirits to execute the cocktails. They're all centered around one spirit, and they're portioned out so well that when you make them, they will actually use most of, if not all, of the spirits inside the bottle, so you're not left with a lot of extra stuff. Click the link below and type in Barfly at checkout or go to shakerandspoon.com slash barfly for $20 off your first box. Bar quality cocktails delivered straight to your door and part of the fun of it is that you get to feel proud of yourself for executing these amazing cocktails. That's shakerandspoon.com slash barfly for $20 off your first order. All right, I think it's time to get into making the cocktails. Obviously, I'm very in love with the Violet Hour and Toby Maloney's drinks. So for today's video, I decided to make some drinks that I haven't yet tasted, and we can taste them all for the first time together, talk about them a little bit, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's get into it. The first cocktail up is the Juliet and Romeo. This is the Violet Hour's most popular cocktail. It was created by Toby Maloney in 2007. It was so popular that it is still on the menu and called for today. First thing we are going to do is grab our tin. So a lot of you guys have been asking me about this chamber juicer. So uh, Barfly Mixology Gear decided that they would make their own. And so now we have a link below to this chamber juicer for all of you guys have been asking me about it. It's nice and heavy, and it actually works a little bit better than the other one that we have. So I'm really excited about it. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, two drops rose water, and then two drops Angostura. So we're gonna do five drops of 10% saline solution, or you can just do one pinch of kosher salt. Two ounces of beef eater gin, eight to 10 leaves of mint, three cucumber slices. And then we're just gonna give this guy a light press before we shake it here, making sure to press that mint down, but only get the oils out and not shred it at all. And just add some ice to our big tin, add our cocktail, give it a nice shake. And then give it a strain. And then what we're gonna do to garnish it is we're going to take a little leaf, like so, give it a nice tap. You want one that's kind of seaworthy. And we wanna float it on top, because we're gonna do three drops of rose water on the leaf. And then on the cocktail itself, we're gonna just do a couple drops of Angostura bitters, like so. So basically this cocktail is an east side. You've got the mint, cucumber, lime, simple syrup, and gin. 
What makes it so nice, you get a little pop from the saline that we put in there, and then that kind of enhances the flavors, and you get the rose water, which brings in this nice floral note. And then the Angostura bitters, which gives it a little spice note. And so you've taken this cocktail, right, that we're very familiar with, one of my favorites to introduce people to gin, and you've just tweaked it, but you've tweaked it enough that you turned it into something completely different. It's very, very understandable why this is the most popular cocktail, so much so that it has persisted for over 10 years, and I definitely think you guys should go mix it. So there you have it, the Juliet and Romeo. So the next cocktail that we're doing is a really nice New York sour variation called the Stone Cold Fox. It was created by Alyssa Height around 2015, and you guessed it, for the Violet Hour, Let's get into it. First things first, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. And then we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of orgia. Half an ounce of fresh pineapple juice. Half an ounce of Amaro Montenegro. Two ounces of Acholado Pisco. We're gonna add some ice up in here. I didn't cut very small pieces. Scotia Pebble. Whip shake it. And we're gonna pour. I'm gonna add in a little Scotia soda here. About an ounce. And then we're gonna do half an ounce of light bodied red wine and then just float that on the top like so. We're gonna garnish with a mint sprig. All right, slappy poo, crushy pants. And then we're just gonna Add that in like so. Aha, and there it is, the Stone Cold Fox. Yay, let's taste it. Mmm, it's so good. I'm gonna taste it with a little bit of the wine though. Oh, the wine brings in a nice bit of acidity. It brings in some nice, you know, a little bit of those tannins. This drink is fantastic. It's bright. It's a little tropical. Uh, it's really well balanced. You got your lime and you know your orsha, which also brings in a little bit of texture. Uh, you can feel that pineapple in there, kind of sweetening things up. At the same time, you you still get the tartness from the lime, and so everything's nicely balanced. And then you get a bit of acid and some of the tannins uh, from the wine. It's a light-bodied wine, so it's not overwhelming. It is such a good drink. Here you are, the Stone Cold Fox. The next cocktail we're doing is from bartender Kirk Estopinol, which is one of the bartenders that was responsible for the book Rogue Cocktails, which we have covered on the show a little bit. And he makes some crazy wacky cocktails that work really, really well. The Rogue Cocktails turned into a book called Beta Cocktails, which is still available on uh, Blurb, which is where they kind of self-publish their book. Uh, I'll leave a link below. And uh, Beta Cocktails came about because Rogue Brewing Company decided to sue them over the name of the book. And so they had to, they had a cease and desist and they had to change. Six drops of Angostura bitters. Eighth of an ounce, which is the equivalent of three quarters of a teaspoon of Branca Menta. And then we'll just eye out another half of this. This is half a teaspoon. No. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. Three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. And this is a one-to-one -one simple, just in case you were wondering. Two ounces of Brogal Añejo rum, which is what the recipe called for specifically. So it's got like a, a very vibrant kind of flavor, but then it doesn't linger on your palate and it's it's just a very short finish. And so it's good for mixing. You know, it's not, I don't want to say it's not good for sipping, but it's just not something that I would technically sip. Some ice. Give it the old Leandro hard shake. Give this a strain, look at that. Oh, I got some nice aeration in there. So this one's actually pretty similar to the Juliet and Romeo and it calls for a single, you know, mint leaf, seaworthy, smack to release the oil, slappy pood, placed on top. I'm just gonna do a couple few drops of the menta on top of the leaf. And that's good because you can get those nice aromatics. Ooh, let's give this guy a taste. Yeah, you, you know what's funny is that you really get the vibrancy of that rum. You taste the menta, but it's really, it almost serves to enhance the rum a little bit. And you get that nice menthol kind of aftertaste. You know, obviously this is a play on a daiquiri, 
You got your lime juice, simple syrup, the rum. It's a beautiful rum for a daiquiri for sure. It's really nice. You have a little bit of spice from the Angostura bitters. It's just a nice, simple drink. So there you have it, my friends. The Tiger Balm. The next cocktail we're doing is the last cocktail of the video. It is called Amaros and Sorrows, which is the greatest cocktail name ever. Uh, it was created by a bartender named Jim Troutman around 2016. And it kind of reminds me a bit of my own bitter Italian cocktail. And so I had to do it. Not to mention it uses this really nice uh, Amaro Sfumato from Capoletti, which is a Rabarbaro, which is a rhubarb Amaro, which is fan freaking tastic. Uh, and I think it's pretty widely available, so you guys can get it. All right, enough yibba yabba. First thing we're gonna do, this is the only egg we have if I mess this up. We can't do this cocktail. Uh, I like to do this separately because if I mess up, then I won't completely ruin the cocktail, just in case I get any shells in here. So we'll just keep this to the side, maybe make a prairie oyster with it later. So we got our egg white in there. We're gonna make the cocktail here. Half an ounce of lemon juice into the tin. One ounce fresh pineapple. Hey, if you don't have fresh pineapple, go to Trader Joe's and get their canned pineapple. It's actually pretty good. And then we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Actual recipe calls for the, um, the red bitter from, from Luxardo, but I was not able to find it. And this is very close in flavor profile. So this is gonna be a little bit different, but it's gonna work just fine. And we're gonna do half an ounce of the red bitter. And then an ounce and a half of this uh, Sfumato Rabarbaro. Now you wanna dry shake this, reverse dry shake it, however you wanna do with whatever type of shake you want. We're just gonna add that into our egg white and give it a nice dry shake. Because this is an egg white cocktail, I like to use a big rock of ice. This limits dilution and it gives you superior foam, gives you a lot of texture. Uh, you wanna make sure that this guy sweats or when you put it into the cocktail, it's gonna break apart. I did not do that because I forgot to take it onto the fridge. What you like to do is put it in here. Maybe we'll let it sit for 10 seconds to temper inside the uh, liquid. And then also if you let it sit for 10 seconds and it cracks, after you let it sit for a second, it can like reform itself a little bit. So in the meantime, we're gonna grab our rocks and our rocks glass and we're just going to fill it with ice. Now I will say I am not the biggest fan of egg white cocktails that sit on ice. The dilution kind of kills the foam. Whenever people say there's a slimy texture in a cocktail, this is why I would rather do this up, but this is the directions from the cocktail's creator. And so I am going to respect his creation and maybe I'll change my mind if it's wonderful. Okay, let's give this guy a shake. Strain it up. It's like milkshake. It's like butter. I'm gonna pull a thick peel here. Zest it. I'm just gonna cut this peel nice. Stick that in like so. That is a goddamn fan. It's like a Maro milkshake. It's so good. The Luxardo Bitter ap Aperitivo is giving it this nice, bitter quality. I gotta say, there is really nothing better than simple syrup, lemon, and that Amaro, that red bitter Amaro. It's, it's really fantastic. And then you got the Rebarbaro, which is giving it a little bit of body. It's also giving it some warmth and depth of flavor. And then of course the pineapple is giving it this nice, I hate to say tropical vibe, but that's what it is. It's just like this nice, tropical flavor. It's just balanced very nicely with all the other flavors. Uh, you have the egg white giving it the nice, you know, uh, milkshake consistency that you really want in egg white cocktails. I'm really not the biggest fan of it sitting on ice, but you know, I'm not gonna, you know, harp about it too much. This is a masterful and fantastic cocktail. So there it is, the Amaros and Sorrows. All right, that's it for today's video. I don't really know if you guys have